Good morning, everyone. It's a, a great pleasure to be here with you again today and to those people who are online, a very special welcome. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together again, to be as one as we share in your word. We thank you for the weather that you have given us, the sunshine and the life-giving rain. Lord, we thank you for all things that are happening in our lives and in our families' lives. And we thank you for those blessings that we've had over the last week, both large and small. In your loving name, amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 22, verses 16 to 21. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet, and I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord... Do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I encourage you to read the whole of Psalm 22. It is a, it is a marvellous psalm. A very, very deep piece of scripture. Our first hymn this morning is Jesus, the name high over all. If we could all stand. And for those at home, the words will be on the screen. Please feel free to sing. And I would remind us that uh, we're supposed to hum along.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we humbly come to you and we bring to you the issues that are heavy upon our hearts. We bring to you loved ones who may be sick or suffering or separated by distance. We bring to you the situations in our life, in work, and we ask that you would address these issues and strengthen us to be able to bear the journey that we are on. We think of our government, Lord, and as we begin to see some light that seems to indicate a return to some semblance of normality, we thank you for them and we thank you for their guidance, for their wisdom and for their care for the people of this beautiful country. Lord, none of us know what tomorrow holds. None of us know where our road will lead or where our road will end. But Lord, we each and every one of us commit ourselves to the path that you have put us upon with a happy heart and the sure knowledge that you guide us and you guide our steps and you place them on the road where you would have them be and you lead us to the destination that you need us to, to, to go to. Lord, we thank you for this guidance. We thank you for this love. We thank you for the love you show to us each and every day and for the many blessings that you bring into our lives. In your loving name, amen. Our reading today is John chapter 3, verses 10 to 17. <clears throat> I'm reading from the ESV. Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If you have... Sorry, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, then how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our next hymn is here is a love vast as an ocean, loving and kindness as the flood. Please stand as we sing, and again the words will be on the screen. <laughs>
please be seated. Over the last few messages I've shared with you all, I've looked at sin and where sin came from and who was responsible for sin. And then I looked at hell and why God created hell. And today I want to look at the third part, which is God killed Jesus so that my sins could be forgiven. We read just a short while ago in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but the world should be saved by him. And that, that's the main focus that I want to look at today, those, those concepts that are contained in those two verses. You know, Dick Van Dyke, who I'm sure we've all heard of, once told a story about a preacher who was showing his four-year-old son a picture of Jesus. But the man didn't want his son to get the wrong idea so he said to his son, son, I want you to realise that this isn't really a picture of what Jesus looked like. This is just an artist's impression. The boy leaned over and looked more closely at the picture and then he looked up at his dad and he said, well, it certainly looks like him to me. You know, there have been numerous paintings of Christ throughout the ages. There's the European paintings, which I'm sure most of, most of us have seen. There's the painting of the black Jesus. There's paintings of a Hispanic Jesus. There's even paintings of an Oriental Jesus. And without doubt, I'm sure we've all seen pictures and paintings of the Jewish Jesus, which is actually the race he came from. But no matter how Jesus is, is, is portrayed in art, we still have no idea of exactly what Jesus looked like. And you know what? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter because if it did matter, the early church would have painted his image everywhere. And the Bible itself would have given us a detailed description of what he looks like which it doesn't do. And that is because it's not what Jesus looks like that matters. It's what Jesus did that matters. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His son was Jesus. That whoever should believe in him, Jesus, might not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus is a key. He's a very important key. Romans 5.8 says, God shows us his love in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You see, that's the picture of Jesus that scripture paints. Jesus equals the Son of God. The Son of God born to die upon a cross for our sins. Another person wrote, there is, ab there is absolutely no reason why my 10-year-old self should have ever doubted that there was a God and that he loved me and that he gave his son Jesus for me. That's the image of a 10-year-old. That's the version that that writer saw when they were 10. But as he grew older, things got more and more complex. And he eventually got to the point where he asked, why? Why did God have to kill his son in order to forgive my sin? Why couldn't he just say, Eric, it's okay, mate. I know you're not perfect. 
It's all right, you're forgiven. Why couldn't he just say that? And this became a real sticking point for this person. But whether it's a sticking point for anyone or not, that is what the Bible teaches. That is the image of Christ that is painted across the scriptures. The Son of God dying upon a cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Now that said, the righteous question still does have merit. Why did God have to kill his son so that my sins and your sins could be forgiven? Why couldn't he just say, it's okay, I know you didn't mean to do it. I love you. It's forgiven, it's forgotten about. Let's not look back, let's move forward. So let's try and answer that question. Firstly, why did God have to kill his son for my sins to be forgiven? Well, it helps if we remember that sacrifice for sin is taught right throughout the Old Testament. In Hebrews 9.22, it tells us, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. In other words, something had to die to atone for sin. In fact, you see back in Genesis that Adam and Eve sinned. And what did they do? They tried to cover up their nakedness with fig leaves. But that just wasn't going to get the job done. They were still ashamed of what they'd done. But if we go to Genesis 3.21, it says, The Lord made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Garments of skin. Where would God get garments of skin from? He got it from animals. Animals had to die to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. Did those animals volunteer their skins? No. But they still had to die. And that was the recurring theme throughout Scripture. Something had to die so that our sins could be covered. When the Ark of the Covenant was constructed, the top of the Ark was called the Mercy Seat. And every year the High Priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would carry with him the blood of an innocent sacrifice which was then placed on the Mercy Seat. But Why? Why was the blood placed there? The answer is to literally cover the sins of the people. Literally the blood of the sacrificed shielded their sins from God's eyes. Psalm 5.4 tells us, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. And Habakkuk 1.13 describes God in this way. You are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. The blood covers the sins of the people so that God didn't have to look at their wickedness. As I was preparing this sermon, I remember the phrase cover your eyes. And I thought, what does this phrase actually mean? Well, what it means is when something happens that's so embarrassing, so painful for you to look at, that you cannot bear to look upon it. So I searched the phrase on the internet and the phrase cover your eyes and I discovered something most intriguing. There are people out there, they're experts. They're experts on body language. 
on reading body language. And what these experts say is that there's a phenomenon, and the phenomenon is called eye blocking. From a psychological point of view, eye blocking is when you're standing on the side of the road and you see a bus or a truck hurtling down the road and someone steps out in front of it and you turn away or you shield your eyes because you can't remove yourself from that spot and you don't want to see the carnage that is about to be unleashed on that person. It is too horrifying. So your brain quickly takes over, closes your eyes and turns your face away from what's about to happen. And most people don't even realise that they're doing it. But what they're doing is executing what is called eye-blocking behaviour. So eye-blocking is when a person displays a physical body reaction that clues you in to indicate that you're looking away. It could be because you're embarrassed. It could be because you're offended. It could be because you're pained by something you're about to see. And some of these clues to eye blocking are things like closing your eyes for a second or a few seconds, looking down, looking away, putting your hand up to your forehead to massage your forehead, which inadvertently blocks your eyesight. These are all forms of eye blocking. And these experts note that even people who have been born blind do it. People who have been born blind who are embarrassed by something that's being said or by an image that they're creating in their own mind from what they're hearing exercise eye blocking. And this suggests that eye blocking may be inherent to every single one of us. It's in our genetic makeup, whether we can see it or not. Now, granted that there is nothing that God cannot and does not see with or without blood, but apparently whenever God saw the blood of the sacrifice, it was fine. Whenever he didn't see the blood of the sacrifice, he would avert his gaze. He would look away. But I think the covering of our sins with blood may have been more for the benefit of the offerer. <coughs> In covering our sins with blood, the blood of a sacrifice that we've made, or they made back then, they are acknowledging that their sins were truly offensive to God. They were acknowledging that they were embarrassed by what they'd done. And more importantly, by offering the sacrifice, they were admitting that they needed forgiveness from God. It would teach them to blush. Jeremy 6.15 reads, God condemned Israel because they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. They did not know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At that time I will punish them and they will be overthrown. So God wanted to teach his people to be ashamed of sin, to learn how to blush. Now, of course, that's nice. But why would God require blood to cover our sins? Why didn't God ask us, I don't know, to offer turnips, potatoes, carrots, Lima beans. No one likes lima beans. You can, you can have all the lima beans. Why did something have to die? Why did something have to shed its blood for us to be forgiven? Well, let's go back to Genesis. Back to Genesis 2.17. 
And God, in this piece of scripture, told Adam that he should not eat from the tree of knowledge, of knowledge of, of good and evil. For in that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. The punishment for sin is death. It was death, it still is death. And that's why Romans 6.23 tells us, quite plainly, for the wages of sin is death. It's right at the beginning of it. But the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's very important too. Leviticus 17.11, another verse that shows us why. In Leviticus 17.11, it said this, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's sin. It's the blood that makes a covering. It's the blood that blurs it out. The Old Testament taught us that the price for our sin is either our death or the death of a substitute. Something needs to die in our place. And as a result, all the sheep and goats and cattle, lots of them, were offered every year as a sacrifice so that their blood could cover the sins of the people. And someone once observed that the Bible is a bloody book and it doesn't matter where you cut it, it bleeds. It bleeds. The problem was back then that sheep and cattle and goats and pigeons and all the other animals they, were, they, they sacrificed didn't volunteer to die. They didn't do it willingly. They didn't give up their blood to cover their sins. Their sacrifice was made involuntarily and it was only a stopgap measure until a better sacrifice could be made. And of course, that better sacrifice is where Jesus comes into the picture. You see, one of the inherent fallacies in the writer's comment was the implication that Jesus was a victim. Jesus was a victim of the age, a victim of circumstance. But that's not true. Jesus volunteered. He went willingly. He knew what was going to happen from the beginning of time. So why did God have to kill his son so that my sins could be forgiven? If we turn to Hebrews 12.2, it tells us Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus volunteered. Philippians 2, 6-8 tells us, Though Jesus was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Essentially what it's saying is God became flesh in Jesus. He came down to be with us. He suffered alongside us and ultimately he gave his life for our sins, for my sin. God made the first sacrifice to cover the nakedness of man's sin. God also made the last sacrifice so that his blood could cover our sin. And there was no other way to accomplish that. But hang on a minute. 
that still doesn't answer our question, does it? That still doesn't tell us why God couldn't just say, Eric, mate, it's okay, I forgive you. Adam, Eve, it's all good. It's forgiven. Don't worry about it. Let's just move along. Why couldn't he just do that? Why go all through, through all this trouble, through all these sacrifices, through all this blood, and ultimately his own son dying upon the cross? And that in itself, I think, is an excellent question. The answer is that God just couldn't forgive me because our God is a righteous God. He decreed not only the law, but he was also subject to the laws himself. We've all heard politicians who are criticised for passing laws and legislation that they don't have to obey. But it upsets us to see the hypocrisy that they're displaying because we have to abide by those laws, but they put themselves above it. We see them decreeing that we have to follow rules and regulations, but their rules and regulations that those politicians themselves have no intention of or never will apply to themselves. But God, the God we have in our scripture, the God that reigns over us, is different to that. The rules that apply to us also apply to him. To help you visualise this, I want to tell you a, a brief story. And I'm sure it's one you may have heard a different version of, but that's fine. It's the story of King Arthur and of Camelot. And as I said, there are several different versions of this story, but this one is particularly interesting. King Arthur, in this particular version is pictured as a righteous king. He was determined to make his land a nation of laws where all people could be protected by the law. And, and as a result, ruthless and powerful men wouldn't be able to ride roughshod over them. And as he does this, his law is enforced by the knights of his round table. As the story goes on, it takes a sad twist. Guinevere, his beloved wife and queen, has an affair with Lancelot. Lancelot, King Arthur's most trusted knight. They were discovered in their sin. But while Lancelot escapes, Guinevere is not so fortunate. Guinevere faces trial. And the jury finds her guilty and sentences her to the flame. As the day of the execution nears, people come from miles around with one question in their mind. Will King Arthur let his one true love Guinevere die at the stake? Guinevere enters the courtyard. She walks to the unlit stake. The executioner stands there waiting with a torch in hand. Arthur turns away, emotion brimming in his eyes. And the herald cries out, The Queen is at the stake, Your Majesty. Shall I signal the torch? But Arthur's devastated and he cries, I can't, I can't let her die. Standing next to Arthur is Mordred, Arthur's illegitimate and evil son. Mordred despises Arthur and everything that Arthur stands for. And indeed, if truth is told, Mordred helped create the situation that Arthur now faces. And Mordred almost laughs and he says to Arthur, Arthur, what a magnificent dilemma. Let her die and your life is over. Let her live and your life is a fraud. Which will it be, Arthur? Do you kill the Queen or do you kill the law? You, you, Arthur, are human after all. Human 
and helpless. Mordred rightly noticed or noted that Arthur, if he carries out the sentence, upholds the law and proves himself to be an impartial and just king. But in doing so, he must execute the woman he loves. As Mordred pointed out, Arthur was helpless because he was only human. He couldn't save the one he loved. Thousands of years ago, God was faced with this same dilemma. Psalm 7.11 declares, God is a righteous judge. And the Lord decreed the wages of sin is death. We saw that earlier. If God would uphold the law, he would have to destroy us. But he would prove himself to be just and impartial. And yet he loved us. We were made in his image. He didn't want to destroy what he created. Let's go back to John 3.16 again. And God declares right there, for God so loved the world. And he loved us so much that he found a way to fulfill the law as he decreed it. And at the same time, rescue us, his creation, from that sentence, from that verdict of death. And the rest of John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In other words, God became flesh so that he could be the sacrifice for our sins, so that the blood of God would cover up our shame, would cover up our guilt. Christ would pay the price that he was undeserving of. I'm baffled. How could someone hear this truth, hear of this love that God has for each and every person on this planet, not just in this room or not just watching on YouTube? This was a love that he had for every single person who has ever drawn breath, for every person who will draw breath in the years to come. This love is an unending love. It's an undeserved love. And yet, people in our society continue to turn away from that love. They continue to choose the way of the world. They continue to denigrate themselves, to say, hello, I'm a helicopter. I'm a man born in a woman's body. God does not make mistakes. God has never made a mistake. I could turn around and I could say, God made a mistake with me and my family. He brought us here. We thought for a long time. But it's for a short time. And sadly, we have to return home soon. But God doesn't make mistakes. He had a reason for bringing us here. He had a reason for bringing all of you people here in person and online into our lives. God loves us all. He always has, he always will. Don't lose the opportunity. Don't turn away from God. Bow your head and simply say, Father, I have sinned. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Forgive me. And you become a member of the largest family on the planet. And he will guide you and he will change your life and you will see those changes and so will your friends. And it will all be for the better because God loves you. God loves Michael. God loves Jill. God loves Debbie. God loves us all, and he always will. Our final hymn for today. (coughs) 
I can't read because I don't have my glasses on. Is the power of the cross a fitting hymn to close the service? The words will be on the screen. Please listen to these words. Let them penetrate your heart and your mind and consider what God and his son have done for you.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the words in that song we just sang are so true. What a love, what a cost. And because of that love and because of that price that you paid, we do stand before you forgiven. Forgiven of all our wrongs, forgiven of all the deeds that we've ever done, of every offence we've ever caused you. Lord, we thank you with a thanks that really doesn't understand the depth of that love or indeed the depth of that price. But we thank you regardless. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you would bless us and watch over us as we go about our week until we once again come together next Sunday. In your loving name, amen. Our benediction today is from Jude 1, 24 to 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to, the pre- and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority, before all time, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I wish you all throughout the week, and especially to our friends who are watching online. Have a great week. Be blessed by God. Thank you.